when you think about Bioshock Infinite's characters, I, I, in, in Bioshock 1, I think the biggest character in the world was actually the world, the world of Rapture. And I think with Infinite, we're, we're continuing that tradition as well, that there's a lot of narrative told in the world and you know, very much probably on the same scale as there was with Bioshock 1. But we also saw an opportunity to bring um, the dynamic element to of the storytelling to the characters. And our challenge is, of course, is that we don't have a real, a very presentational medium. I mean, you think about storytelling in a lot of games, you're thinking about going to a cutscene or being locked into place, and that's not something we really like to do. And um, so we have, we created this character and named, um, well, two characters, Booker and Elizabeth, you know, one who's a character you inhabit, and um, the other one is a character that, you know, the AI inhabits. Back there at the shop, what you asked me to do. Let's not discuss it. No, what did that thing do to you? If he were to take me back, that's death, Mr. DeWitt. Or something so like it, I cannot tell the difference. Booker is, I, I think you're gonna see him be multi-dimensional throughout the game. Um, starts off very, very simple, and, and if you know history at all, he's a former Pinkerton agent, which those were bad guys. Bad guys feared the Pinkertons. And the fact that he was kicked out of the Pinkerton Agency should kind of give you a little bit of insight into what kind of guy he is. He's seen a lot. He's done a lot. Um, he's got a lot to make penance for. And when he's presented this opportunity, which at first is just a job to him, of getting Elizabeth out of her gilded cage and taking her from point A to point B, um, that's where I think his journey starts, not just in a literal sense, but more of a metaphorical sense as well. Looks as if some desperate fella called this place home. What does that make us? Liz is interesting because she is really coming of age in this story and she's figuring out what kind of woman she wants to be, kind of getting out of that little girl thing which has been, even though she's a little bit older, I think being held captive, I mean, I would assume her whole life or however long Ken decides. She's been held captive by Songbird. She's that's kind of halted her growth in, in terms of defining her independence. So she's figuring that out, and she's very sweet, very compassionate, and also very headstrong, which I like that about her. He's in pain. Not for long. I need you to step back. Wait, 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 wait. wait there's a tear. See right here. Elizabeth, it's just an animal. I can control it this time. It is too powerful. You won't be able to stop it. I wasn't asking for permission. In terms of what I look for in a voice actor, I look for somebody who can inhabit the role. Um, and sometimes they'll bring something to the role that I had no idea and I'll change the role. With both of them, I think I saw people who, who sort of inhabited what I, the basics of what I saw in the character, but they were also very good at taking direction. They're very good at re responding to, um, to feedback. And that's what I mean more, that it's less direction and more feedback, because a lot of times I don't even really know what I want, you know, and I'm just sort of saying, let's try in this area. And they're very open to that. And they're really, um, they're really um, generous in the process. And that's been incredibly helpful. You know, I have an interesting relationship with the actors in the sense that I ideally would like to hire actors and bring them in and say like, okay, I totally got this figured out, guys. This is just what you hear. Here's your piece of paper, go do X, Y, and Z. And that's just not the case in this game because we're doing something that we don't haven't really done before. So when we start sessions with them, I basically have a bunch of writing I've done and a, a bunch of sort of scenes we want to do. And sometimes those scenes end up, um, they're very prototypical of what we're actually going to end up with. And I basically try to be very honest with them and say, look, I don't really exactly know how we're going to get there. And we just sort of sit around and talk about it. And um, we record a lot of stuff. We keep the, you know, the recordings going, we keep the camera, it's going, um, the camera's on Courtney's face so we can get um, emotional reference from her face as well as her, as her voice. <sighs> Elizabeth. Promise me. I will stop him. No. That is an oath you cannot keep. But promise me that if it comes to it, you will not let him take me back. It won't come to that. All right. The benefits of working with a voice actor directly is, you know, that sort of interactive process. Um, there's a sequence where Troy's rating Courtney to get a certain performance, a moment we needed. And that wasn't just Troy being an asshole. That was, 
you know, me asking Troy to help get Courtney to an emotional place. Whenever you're ready. Okay. <clears throat> so you, do you need something to build to it? I'm thinking. I'm not just ignoring. Would help if he, ber- <laughs> if he berated you a bit. A what? If he berated you a bit, mm-hmm. berated you. Mm. Yeah, sure. What you know? Like, what were you doing? What were you thinking? You're never gonna moron. work. You're gonna get us fucking killed. I like that. Keep going. Yeah, uh, Troy, don't be afraid of it. No, really, no, no, I'm not. Really I'm go not. into her. Yeah, yeah. No, I just don't worry about You fucking yet. child. Shut up. You know, it's a Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross <laughs> beating up. It makes me so uncomfortable. Keep going. I don't care if you're uncomfortable or not. Pull it the fuck together. You've either got this or you don't. The fuck were you thinking? <laughs> Keep at her, Troy. Keep at her. No, she's got it. She just needs to fucking focus. Don't fucking laugh! Okay, you were right. I can't control it. It's it's not possible. With what I've seen lately, I wouldn't put a nickel on what's possible. Now come on. I think it's time we found Comstock, okay? Can we do it once more? Yeah, that's okay. good. That's good. Well, you yell, you fucking psychopath. Can you scream at me a little more, <laughs> and then be nice. You know, to say, what, what's it like working with Kim Levine? And I always answer with, I, I don't know. I'll let you know, because so far we're not working. We're just we're playing. We're having fun. We're in a sandbox. You know, it's not work. It, it can be exhausting, but so can you know, riding roller coasters all day. I kind of. <laughs> Can we just try it? I know you don't want to. Ben, I want to see what you do with it. Oh, great. No pressure. Nope. I think that, you know, we sort of have a couple of rounds of, of, of a few rounds of, of experiments, and now we're sure, starting to understand our process a lot better, and that will help move the process along more quickly, and then we'll find, you know, new challenges we'll take on, and, that, and, and we'll get stuck again, and we'll just have to figure those out. If, if we were to have a mission in the game space, it's that we want to bring the player to make them a participant in the narrative. By bringing um, this character, Elizabeth, into the game, by having her with you pretty much for almost the entire game, we knew that if we didn't get her right, the game wouldn't be right. And she really is the emotional center of the game. This character, Elizabeth, she comes from a pretty dark place. and. But she's also got an incredible amount of enthusiasm for life. And when we found Courtney, I think we found somebody who could who could do both. I don't dance. Come on, let's go. Why? What could be better than this? It's so complex. I mean, you're talking about really trying to, to bring forth all the complexities of human nature that impact us because you're having to use only your voice to convey your entire, you know, the character and what you're trying to portray you have to put your entire body into it. So there are times when I'm doing voiceover work and I'm literally drenched in sweat because my body is working so hard. Hey, knock it off! Stop it! Will you stop it? I'm not here to hurt you. Who are you? My name is DeWitt. I'm a friend. I come to get you out get of here. Get away! No! <gasps> It's not these one-note emotions. And, and I think that's what was so important to us as a collaborative team, to be really putting forth a narrative that was strong and that was complex and that was you know, reflective of how deep and um, the myriad of emotions that the human beings experience. She really had a sense of telling a story and having a conversation with no words. If you're watching a silent film, you understand what's going on and you don't need words. We saw her and Sean's like, by the way, this is the girl. I'm like, oh yeah, that's the girl, absolutely. I had to really rely on my imagination and rely on what I was being told by, you know, the director. Weird <laughs> for me to see myself, like literally, like every movement that I did. Yeah. I mean, I can, I see myself in it. I mean, it might not be my face, but the thing is, is she's actually in a world. When I did it, I was in like an empty room. Yeah. They put me out into this giant sort of basketball court, it looked like, with stuff taped out on the floor that was sort of like the imaginary, you know, world. She had to do a lot of physical things that I 
probably wouldn't do in my everyday life, you know, kicking some butt and, uh, you know, with a bat and like beating the hell out of something. It just started to feel like it was my voice, you know, I just really started to connect with it physically and this voice was all one. I don't understand, how could we get there? The incredible voice acting and the incredible uh, motion capture acting was the most useful and inspiring element that we could have had for Elizabeth. Liz will follow you around the world and if you decide that you don't want to go where she thought you were heading, she can handle that really, really cleverly. She will stop if you stop. She will keep running if you decide that you're not interested in what you're doing here. She will be by your side no matter what you end up doing. The moment you come up against a character who's just sort of standing there or behaves robotically or behaves in a way that is so alien to what you'd expect out of a human being, you just shut them off and you just say, oh, they're just a video game character. I don't need to worry about feeling anything about them. And so we tried a lot of things. Uh, we tried to make Liz um, have emotions um, so that she can react to things in the world and things that you do. For example, we might say that Liz will feel comfortable leaning against this wall, but she'll do so with her arms crossed. And she'll do so with her back slightly turned towards you. And that difference of just a few degrees is enough to make the player feel that they're really in the doghouse. You're gonna see her all over the place. You're gonna see her on giant billboards in you know, New York and LA, and you're gonna see her on TV ads. I said, okay, well, if we're gonna find a person to play Elizabeth, I think we already have that person. В один прекрасный день мне пришло сообщение на Facebook от Кена Левина о том, что у них есть ко мне предложение, от которого я не смогу отказаться. Просьба связаться по электронной почте и, соответственно, вокруг меня все суетились, 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 чего-то хотели, потом сказали, так, все, начинаем работать, посадили меня на стул, сказали просто сиди, смотри прямо в одну точку. И опять начали вокруг меня бегать, снимая с меня скан лица. Я думаю, ну ладно, что, окей, хорошо. Я с этим справлюсь, а потом меня вдруг начали мучить, говорить, смейся, плачь, делай одухотворенное лицо, делай удивленное лицо. And all of a sudden we found this great character existed in the space between the real world and the world of Bioshock Infinite. There was a moment where we had people coming up to us and saying, Liz is awesome. She did, I have a story to tell you about. And it was, everybody had their own unique stories because she was just doing systemic things. They could do the same thing twice. I actually get people telling me things that there's no way I could know about. Like, say there's one of the, the combats kicking off and they're having this incredible moment where they're running around the place and smashing someone in the face and blowing someone else up with a shotgun and they've suddenly a huge big boss man comes up and they just go, click! Oh no! <laughs> and then suddenly from the side, Liz goes, Booker, over here! You press the button, she throws it, you grab it and just go, boom! And they come up to me and go, and it was amazing! And I was like, yeah, me and Liz, we're gonna kick ass, we're gonna, nothing we can't do. That's right. Even if we just break that barrier sometimes, where people feel she's she's a, a friend or, a, or, or somebody going through this experience with them, then that would be very exciting for me. I really hope people fall in love with her. Um, I fell in love with her. I forget she's a real, not a real person sometimes, and I know Courtney really well. And I forget sometimes that there's that that's not that that's Courtney's voice, and that's Heather's motion, and that's the team's uh, other work. And I, she becomes a real person to me many times. And I think the reason we call her Liz internally is because she became a real person to us um, in a lot of ways. Elizabeth has been locked in her tower for however many years it was, and now instead she's going to be released from her secondary tower, which is our studio, and let loose in the world for real. And that's just an incredible feeling. Let's go, come on, let's go. Come on, let's go right now. In Bioshock, Tenenbaum, the character Tenenbaum was sort of exploring the work that was going on in DNA at the time. You know, the work that Crick and Watson were doing. And she was building upon that. And that, you know, a very, very radical, enhancement of that work was done by Tannenbaum and, and, and Su Chong, and you get the world of plasmids that make the original Bioshock. Elizabeth's not a scientist, but she has the ability to interact with the kind of science that was being done in this period, the 
kind of science that was being done by Einstein, the kind of science that was done, was being done by Heisenberg, all this sort of the world of physics that's being explored, you know, around the turn of the century, and how the science, in the same way Crick and Watson were opening our eyes up to what was inside our body, these scientists, Einstein and Heisenberg and, and Max Planck, were, were opening our eyes to what existed around the universe. And um, everybody can see in the world of Columbia these tears that are windows into these worlds that Heisenberg and, and Einstein were starting to explain to us. Elizabeth can actually reach into those worlds and, man and manipulate them. And that's what her power, that's what you're seeing her do in the world. And that becomes this great game system we call the tears in Bioshock Infinite, where you'll be in a space and you'll see uh, a, a window where you see a skyline that doesn't exist in, in, in the Columbia that, that, that Booker is in. You'll see a turret maybe that doesn't exist in the, in, in the, in the Columbia that Booker exists in. You'll see a, a bunch of founders who might come in and help you fight the Vox Popular guys you're, you're fighting, who doesn't exist in the world of version of Columbia that, that Booker is in. And Elizabeth is essentially saying to you is, I can bring one of these three in for you, Booker. Which one do you want me to bring in? And that's up to the player. I think I can help. Just tell me which one you want. That way, now. We're gonna have all these tools that player has that the player can access via Elizabeth that is gonna make everybody's play experience different. And that's that's what we always want with Bioshock. We want the way I play it, the way you play it, the way he plays it to be different. Um, and that's Elizabeth's ability to manipulate terrorists is just another great way to do that. The city of Columbia was originally built as a um, by the United States government in the 1890s as a sort of a floating world's fair, uh, something they could float from one corner of the earth to the other and demonstrate to the rest of the world the success of the American experiment. Think of the Statue of Liberty, you know, but it can move around the world. And what happened was there was a power struggle within Columbia. And this um, fellow who you will sort of start to get a sense of in, in this demo, named Comstock, came into power in the city. And he had a bit of a different view. He had a more, um, I guess, extreme view of what the mission of America and the world is. And there were some people in the city who didn't like that. And that group was the Vox Populi. And it started as a, a sort of a resistance, uh, a, almost like a student movement against, you know, the founders, uh, you know, the, the founders group that Comstock led as, you know, working to help, you know, to unionize workers, to protect the rights of minorities, things like that within the city. But as, as the conflict between the founders and the Vox Populi got more extreme, each side started sort of ramping up their actions. And by the time you get to Columbia and start, and you'll see the, the Vox Populi in the demo, the, the conflict is pretty extreme and both sides have a bit of an attitude of, well, as long as we win, nothing else matters. And you'll encounter the founders last time and sort of got a sense of the dark side of them. And this time you'll encounter Daisy Fitzroy, who's the leader of the Vox Populi. You'll hear her speaking, you'll see her people at work and what they're doing is they're clean, essentially cleansing a portion of the city, moving the founders out of a portion of the city, a rich part of the city, and coming in themselves, and it's not a pretty picture to behold. Well, Skylines were built in Columbia as a transportation system. Originally, the, you know, when you have this vertical city, you need some way to get uh, you know, product from one place to another. But what started happening along the way is, first it was kids, because it's always kids, right? Started figuring out a way to get, the, get these sky hooks that they could connect to the lines, and sort of get from one place to the city and do these acrobatic feats on them. But as the situation in Columbia started devolving and the place got more violent and normal routes of transportation started getting disrupted, and people started using the skylines to get around. People, the, the Vox Populi and the um, founders started using it for in combat situations. And all of a sudden, the requirement for guys who knew their way around a skyline and who could, could, could fight effectively on the skylines became way more important. And um, by the time Booker gets to um, to Columbia, the skylines have a broad range of usage, and there's, you can still see, you'll see in the demo, cargo being moved around on those things. That creates even a more hazardous situation. But there's also people using it um, for all kinds of purposes, including um, and especially combat.
one of the, my big frustrations in working on Bioshock 1 is we had the ocean, but it was really just a piece of art. We never really dealt with, you know, what it was like to fight at the bottom of the ocean in, in any meaningful way. Um, and in, in Infinite, you know, we wanted you to be in the sky. We wanted the visuals, obviously, of that, which I think are really great. But we also wanted vertical combat. And we played around with lots of ideas for like f using flight and stuff like that for a while. But in the end of the day, you know, to me, the experience of being on a plane versus the experience of being on a roller coaster is a very different experience. For me, it's always been about wooden roller coasters. I've never been as much a fan of the steel ones. And that sort of clackety clack feeling of, you know, that going up to the top of a hill and then going over and that amazing feeling you have. And I really want to put that in a game. I want to get that feeling in the game. And then of course, being a video game, I want to enhance that with combat. I want to be on one of those wood, old wooden roller coasters that's stacked upon another wooden roller coaster in this city and jumping from one to the other with weapons, with, you know, with people shooting at me. I just wanted to get that feeling. And, you know, this isn't a monorail. This isn't a people mover. This is something that is incredibly vertical. It's incredibly open-ended. And that's what Bioshock games are about. They're about giving the player a ton of tools and a ton of options and just letting them go to town. The skyline, follow me. Tell you the truth, it took a long time to get it right, but I think we're really at the stage now where it feels just great, um, and it looks awesome, and it, and it feels awesome, and it's one of it's one of our biggest challenges on Infinite, and I, I think we're really getting there. What I personally would have liked to have seen in in, in a Bioshock game is sort of a broader range of enemies, and I think um, in Bioshock Infinite, we really want to have a sort of a class of enemies that had a, a sort of a, a a more imaginative range of powers and. We came up with this concept called the heavy hitters, who are enemies that are sort of used to not just be more powerful, but also to augment the abilities of the more traditional Bioshock enemies. You're gonna come across them in, in certain areas of the game, and they're gonna provide a really unique challenge. You know, we wanted a an AI that really expressed sort of the the very sort of clear system of beliefs the founders have and, 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 and a heavy hitter that would sort of represent that. And the Motorized Patriot is a um, is sort of the embodiment of that. And they came up with this idea of this creepily motorized, like Hall of Presidents animatronic George Washington. It was specifically the face, specifically this weird, like, porcelain child dolls, you know, poor rendering of George Washington. That kind of clinched it. Everybody saw it and said, okay, that we can we can roll with that. It's one of those rare moments where you kind of all come together and you realize, okay, this is this is gonna work. We're all on the same page here. Let's just move forward with what we got. I could use a turret on it. Booker the gear. So the motorized patriot, a um, couple of things make him really special besides the aesthetic of him. One is that he's unlike most of the enemies, he's completely fearless. Um, he doesn't have a sense of self-preservation. So who just keep coming at you and coming at you and coming at you. You know, despite the fact that you face many different kinds of enemies in this game, you clearly can't reason with this one. He's just gonna keep coming forever, you know? He is sort of a clockwork terminator. The other cool thing about him, he's got this um, Gatling gun called a pepper mill. But once you destroy the Patriot, Booker can actually um, go pick up the, the pepper mill and actually use it as a heavy weapon. And that's the only place he can get it was from a, a destroyed motorized Patriot. I mean, I also like that, you know, as he starts to take serious damage, his head will, he actually loses the Washington mask and it reveals his sort of, his sort of metal skeleton underneath. The thing I like most about this guy is that I think he's pretty readable as what he does. You know, he's a fairly, Simple guy. He's not. He's not a Swiss Army knife. He's a guy with a big gun, and I think that reads pretty well. He's got this incredible sense of heaviness. He's relentless, and just hearing sort of the, the things he's saying is both funny and kind of terrifying. But he's, you know, a deadly, deadly enemy. So the, the, the handyman or the handymen, there's there's a bunch of them in the world, are a um, they're sort of a tragic figure, and I don't want to go into a ton of detail about sort of how these guys got put in these metal bodies, but there's a, there's a certain sadness to um, who they are and how they got there, but I'd rather the gamers find that out in the course of the game. 
The term handyman comes from his giant porcelain hands that we created. And if you look at toys of, the, of that era, they do a lot of work on trying to make the porcelain dolls feel realistic with the way that they paint the hands and the faces, but they're not quite there. It's almost like the original in incarnation of Uncanny Valley. Then we have back and forth and a lot of different designs. One with, you can see like exposed organs, but it was just too on the nose video game with clothes, without clothes, with this head, with that head, um, until we, the one that we finally settled on, um, which is, you know, the exposed heart and the torn clothes and, you know, the bald sort of cut up face. And they have a range of abilities. Um, from the, they, they can leap these great distances in the game, and you know you'll sometimes see them coming, you know, coming in from the sky and landing from a great height, and then they'll be bouncing around in this space. They're quite agile for their size and quite quite powerful. Um, I think their coolest ability, though, is they can pick up AIs, like, like friends or foes, and they can toss them at people. And so I think that everybody around them finds them quite terrifying, including sometimes your enemies, because they just become tools of the handyman to get it, to get a booker. Look, the Boys of Silence, I love them because they're just creepy. I mean, first time I saw it, I think it's rarely this happens where I just see a concept, and I'm like, oh my god, we have to do that, we have to do that. He was spec pretty early, and so the concept went in pretty early, and Ken fell in love with the concept instantly. Instantly, we all did. We all thought it was like the coolest thing we'd ever seen. I mean, anytime you completely obscure something's face, there's a creepiness that falls naturally out of wondering what's going on in there. You know, is it this hideously deformed child? Is there a head at all? You can only assume that it's horrible to be inside that mask, and I, yeah, I think that's where a lot of his, his scare value comes from. So, you know, the way they work is that they're, they're blind, they can't see you, but they can hear you, and you know, the levels that you see them in you have to make a decision on whether you are going to try to sneak around them or engage them directly. But if you anger them, they can call in back up. Their purpose in the world is that they're sort of, I mean, think of the cameras from Bioshock 1, but think of them walking around and moving and looking for you. And he's gonna be, I think he's gonna be scary in the game and somebody the players are gonna love to meet but also hate to meet. So the siren is sort of our nod to a major social movement at the turn of the century, which was a, um, there was a sense of, of the spiritual world. I don't mean like, like you know, when you ask people like, oh, you know, are you religious? They say, no, I'm spiritual. No, I mean, people actually were talking about, you know, contacting the dead and speaking to the dead. The design for the siren began very early on and when we were first looking at these sort of heavy hitter classes and these very special enemy classes. So we started thinking about like the ghost of a performer that could be using her song to, to raise the dead. Um, we started looking at the things that we could do with this kind of mystical, wavy and flowy type of woman who's, who's floating around and, and raising people with her voice. So the, the siren is an entity who's in contact with the other world and actually can bring a Booker's enemies back to life to, to fight Booker once again. One of your challenges is gonna be, who do I deal with? Do I deal with the siren? Um, because if I kill her, then all the enemies that she brought back to life will also return to their graves. What do I do with the guys who are actually shooting at me? And I think that's one of the sort of real tensions that you have in battle. 